we're just giving folks a chance to join us. So maybe we'll give people just another moment and then we'll get going here. So thanks for your patience. So yes, hello everyone. Um, I'm Greg Finley, I'm an instructor at Teradot2. And uh, I'm really pleased to be here this evening, uh, evening, morning, afternoon, whatever time it is for you. We're, we're here to welcome um, our featured guest speaker, Dr. Chip Fletcher, who's joining us from Hawaii. And Chip is a great fan, friend of the Terra community. He has given a talk at every cohort since the very first one. Um, his talks are always considered one of the highlights of the course by the fellows. I was a fellow in this course. I attended Chip's talk, and I have to agree that it was one of the best and the most impactful sessions of the course. And it's a pleasure to welcome him here tonight, or again, whatever time it is for you. Um, Dr. Fletcher is the Interim Dean for Academic Affairs and a Professor of Earth Sciences at the School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And he is the chair of the Honolulu Honolulu Climate Change Commission. His teaching and research focuses on climate change, coastal community resiliency, and natural coastal systems. He's received a number of teaching, research, and community service awards. And together with his students, he's published over 100 peer-reviewed articles, as well as three textbooks. And uh, we're uh, just really honored to have you here tonight, Chip. So thank you very much for being here and uh, take it away. Thanks very much, Greg. Uh, let me share screen and get my PowerPoint started. I will uh, leave time for questions at the end. Uh, of course, we're going to talk about climate change, the climate crisis, but uh, that is not the only global crisis that we have. Uh, we also have biodiversity loss. We've entered an era of pandemics and related to all this uh, is uh, a lack of human equity or equality around the planet. I would also add pollution as uh, one of these global crises, but I'm not gonna cover that today. So this is the uh, record of annual surface temperature on the planet as collected by NASA, the US National Administ um, Aeronautical and Space Administration. Uh, these temperature measurements are relative to the average temperature of the last two decades of the 1800s. And that is considered to be the, uh, uh, the period of time when we have the still reliable measurements of ocean temperature and land temperature and air temperature around the planet uh, so that we have a consistent data set from them. Um, there is uh, a conjecture that the rate of warming is accelerating. Um, Jim Hansen, Dr. Dr. Jim Hansen, former chief scientist at the NASA Goddard Institute of Space Science, uh, has speculated that the last six years represent an acceleration of warming that began in uh, 1980. Um, during the question and answer portion, we can get into what is the variability in this record, but I won't go down that rabbit hole right now. Uh, to date, based on the last six years, we have warmed on the order of 1.1 to 1.3 degrees Celsius above uh, the pre-industrial period. And uh, that may not strike you as very much. It's only a, a degree or more in Celsius and about two degrees Fahrenheit. But you can't think of this level of warming as being um, walking in and out of an air-conditioned room or walking under the shade of a tree if you're walking down the sidewalk. You need to think of this as the fundamental energetics of a system, such as your body temperature. Now, in Fahrenheit, the human body temperature averages 
uh, 98.6 degrees. So a rise in temperature of 2.2 degrees puts us at 100.8 degrees. And a low grade fever is making you feel pretty poorly. You don't want to get out of bed in the morning. It has a very serious impact on your energy level and the functioning of the organs in your body and your metabolism. And all that took was just about two degrees Fahrenheit or a little more than one degree Celsius. So think of Earth's surface as uh, currently running a low grade fever. Now in 2015, the United Nations held uh, one of its annual meetings. These are called COPS, Conference of Parties, under the uh, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And eventually after this meeting, all of the world's nations agreed to cut their greenhouse gas emissions in order to stop warming at two degrees Celsius. But the island nations of the world, especially the four atoll island nations, um, argued strongly that two degrees Celsius was signing their death warrant. And they managed to get wording into the Paris Climate Agreement that the nations of the world will, will pursue efforts to end warming before it reaches 1.5 degrees Celsius. And a few years later in 2018, a special report came out from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, specifically on 1.5 degrees Celsius. And among the findings, this report stated that warming will persist for hundreds to thousands of years, and a whole host of negative impacts, hot extremes, heavy precipitation, sea level rise, species extinction, dramatic impacts to the ocean, uh, re reduced biodiversity on land and uh, in the oceans, and decreased food and water security, decreased human safety, and increased human inequality. And with this report, scientists rallied around the world and realized that really 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming marks the threshold for a safe planet under which humans can continue to thrive. And so two degrees C is now seen as a failed global effort and 1.5 is, is the target. So on this graph, I'm going to show time from 2010 to 2050 on the bottom axis and carbon dioxide emissions on the vertical axis, uh, the black line represents the past decade of CO2 emissions. Uh, we have the COVID recession in 2020, uh, which led to a decline of emissions of about 5.4%. In this year, 2021, or last year, uh, we saw um, a uh, increase in emissions as the economy started to roar back to life. And uh, we've, mere, we've nearly made up the deficit. CO2 emissions rose again 4.9%. And keep in mind, we need to reduce emissions in order to stop warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius. And this is the pathway that has been modeled. Uh, we need to reach net zero emissions by mid-century. And along that pathway, our global emissions need to be cut in half by the end of this decade, eight years from now. Now, with all of the nation's promises under the Paris Accord in 2015, uh, the pledged reductions in greenhouse gas emissions put us on a global pathway to a net warming of two and a half to 2.8 degrees Celsius. But there's a difference between the promises that nations make and the actual policies that they follow. And if you look into the policies that are followed, we see that that actually puts us on a pathway of over three degrees Celsius. This represents a gap. And every year the United Nations comes out with a report on this gap called the Gap Report. And during the recent Glasgow meeting in Scotland uh, in November, the UN issued an addendum or additional information to uh, this gap report. 
And the next day, the Washington Post released a report that they had done that found on average emissions are underreported by about 23%. Uh, so we have the promises, we have the reality, and then we have the underreporting of that reality. Now, we also have the potential failure of the terrestrial biome as a sequestration partner. And what I mean by that is the following. On average, 86% 80 of our CO2 emissions every year are released by burning fossil fuels for the purpose of uh, energy creation and manufacturing and other sorts of industrial socioeconomic activities. And about 14% of our CO2 emissions come from farming and deforestation. Of those emissions, on average, 46% of the CO2 goes into the air and causes global warming. About 31% is pulled out of the air by photosynthesis among living plants on land. And about 23% of those emissions go into the ocean. They are dissolved into the ocean and create ocean acidification. CO2 plus H2O makes H2CO3, which is an acid. And so the oceans are becoming slightly, uh, well, the pH is lowering. And as they warm, it turns out, they're also losing oxygen. Um, so we have a problem with uh, anoxia developing in the, in the world's oceans. Unfortunately, this 31% of drawdown is beginning to fail. So plant photosynthesis removes CO2 from the air. And another process called respiration releases CO2 to the air. Plants go through photosynthesis and respiration. Photosynthesis, however, has a heat limit. And past this limit, photosynthesis sharply declines while respiration continues to increase. So at this thermal limit, the uh, drawdown of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere exponentially is reduced, but the plants continue to release CO2. In other words, they become a net source, a net source of greenhouse gas rather than a sink. With continued emissions, modeling are, is now projecting that uh, the carbon uptake by plants on land may reduce by as much as half in only 20 years. As early as 2040, we may lose the terrestrial biome as a partner in pulling CO2 out of the air. This effect is also not accounted in the national policies by the UNFCCC. Is there evidence of this? Yes, the Amazon. The Amazon contains more than half of all the tropical rainforest on the planet. Logging, mining, hunting, deforestation, damming of rivers, drought, and tree mortality related to rising heat are all having a drastic negative effect on the living system of the Amazon rainforest. So that over the last decade, the Amazon lost one third of all biomass, all living material in the Amazon. One third of it was destroyed. From 2010 to 2019, the Brazilian portion of the Amazon basin gave off 18 billion tons of carbon dioxide, but only pulled down 15 billion tons. So it's now likely that the Amazon is a net source of greenhouse gas emissions. We also see that the boreal forest, the great pine forests of the Arctic, because of drought, tree mortality, and wildfire, are right on the edge 
of converting from a carbon sink to a carbon source as well. So these are the various socioeconomic model pathways that scientists use to project various types of socioeconomic activities and what they might result in, in terms of uh, future CO2 emissions. And this SSP for 6.0 is the one that humans are currently on the road to following. So our emissions are projected to peak around mid-century and then slowly decline so that by the end of the century, we would still be emitting about half of what our current emissions are, which is about 40 billion tons of CO2. So this SSP 4-6.0, the 6.0 refers to the additional energy in the atmosphere resulting from the release of these greenhouse gases. 6.0 means an additional six watts of energy per square meter on Earth's surface. Now, that model takes us to three to three and a half degrees Celsius of warming by the end of the century. So the world is growing hotter especially on land in the summer. The continents are warming faster than the ocean. The ocean has an enormous heat capacity. And living here in Hawaii, our warming is buffered by the ocean's ability to store heat. Whereas living in continental areas, we see heating that exceeds the global average. And in the oceans, we see heating that is less than the global average. Scientists have now determined that roughly 37% of heat-related deaths can now be assigned to the impacts of climate change. Scientists identify what's known as the wet bulb temperature. So, the human body is a heat engine, and we have to offload heat produced by our metabolism. That happens by blood flowing near the skin and releasing heat through the skin. And the, the blood circulation system is the transporter of heat. And if there's something that impedes heat release through the skin, the body builds up the temperature. And one of the most effective ways to interfere with heat release is to coat our skin with a little layer of moisture. And so the humidity of the air leads to a decrease in the offloading of heat from the human body and an increase in uh, the internal temperature. And as we warm, our blood works harder and harder to bring heat towards the skin, that's why we flush. That's why we, uh, we see more and more blood flow to, to our skin area. Well, this blood is being pulled away from the organs. And eventually this heat disease starts to trigger organ failure because it's no, your organs are no longer getting uh, blood flow. And there is what's known as a wet bulb temperature, which is a combination of temperature and humidity uh, of 35 degrees C, which marks the human physi physiological limit. A grown, healthy person in the shade with all the water they could drink at 35 degrees C will eventually die. This extreme humid heat is what is used to model the impacts of heat on human communities. And extreme human heat overall on the planet has more than doubled in frequency since 1979. 
And as I mentioned, we see 37% of all summertime heat-related deaths now attributable to climate change. And paper after paper comes out with model results on this. This paper from Science is titled The Emergence of Heat and Humidity Too Severe for Human Tolerance. Business as usual emissions will lead to super and ultra extreme heat waves in the Middle East and North Africa. Deadly heat waves are projected in the densely populated agriculture regions of South Asia. Escalating global exposure to compound heat humidity extremes with warming is mapped in this paper. And here, we have a paper from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And in the center of the Sahara Desert, you see these black areas, as well as along the coastline of the Red Sea. These areas currently represent less than 1% of the land surface, and they are identified as too hot for human existence. Well, how much of the land becomes too hot for human existence on our current pathway of warming? At three degrees Celsius, we go from eight tenths of 1% too hot for human existence to 19% too hot for human existence. Almost one fifth of the planet's land surface becomes too hot for human existence. Everything in the strong diagonal brown shading Northern Australia, all of Southeast Asia, almost all of India, the Middle East, North Africa, huge parts of South America and Latin America. In fact, from today with one degree C of global warming, every additional degree is going to displace 1 billion people. And by the time we reach three degrees Celsius, we will be displacing one third of humanity. Now you have to ask yourself, what are the political ramifications of millions of people attempting to move into new countries? How generous can a country be with its resources? How long will it last that a country opens its borders to people in need? We already know from the Syrian story with the displacement of 4 million Syrians that the voters in England voted to secede from the European Union. It's called Brexit. And the roots of Brexit are because of the influx of immigrants displaced from North Africa, the Middle East, and largely Syria, and the requirement that in the European Union, every nation has to have open borders, porous borders, without requiring a passport. We saw the rise of authoritarian political figures all across Europe as Syrians attempted to migrate through the EU and we saw more authoritarian political figures getting traction than we've seen since the 1930s. And many of them were running on platforms of closing down the borders, outlawing the practice of the Muslim religion, uh, forbidding the wearing of religious clothing, etc. Now, there are good stories as well. Germany opened its borders to over 1 million people with a very successful plan for moving these climate uh, migrants into various towns across the German countryside. And yes, Syrians were displaced by a civil war, but that civil war was generated by the collapse of the farming economy in Syria. And that came from a thousand year drought over 50% of which was caused by global warming. We know this from modeling and tree ring analysis.
climate change and expanding human needs have also led to food and water impacts. The vast majority of fresh water that we use comes from aquifers in the ground. And the vast majority of the water we use is for producing food, for irrigation, for agriculture of various types. In the continental US, we are withdrawing 17% more groundwater than nature replaces every year. In China, they withdraw 22% more groundwater than is naturally replaced. India, over 50%. North Africa and the Middle East with withdrawal of thousands of percent more fresh water from aquifers than nature can replace. This is the very definition of insustainability. We love to use the term sustainable practices and sustainability, but if you are using your water faster than nature can replace it, you're running, running out of the one resource that we cannot afford to run out of. We do have a global freshwater crisis. And by 2050, water demand is projected to grow by 55%. In fact, already one quarter of humanity faces a looming water crisis every year. 17 different nations are under extremely high water stress, meaning that they're using almost all the water they have every year. And here in India, you can see on the southern shoreline of India, the city of Chennai is a city of 10 million people that actually ran out of water three years ago. Four huge reservoirs ran dry. What happens when a city of 10 million people runs out of water? There are also impacts to food staples, soy, rice, wheat, and corn lose their nutrients and protein content as you raise the CO2 level in the air. So, Food staples grown under higher, higher CO2 have up to 13% less protein. It's replaced by carbohydrates, zinc, vitamin B complex, and iron. Let's take wheat as an example. Global wheat currently provides one fifth of all human protein on this planet. The yield is threatened by drought, flood, and higher CO2. By 2050, the demand for wheat is projected to increase by 60%, but the actual yield is projected to decline by 15%. By mid-century, an additional 300 million people will experience the loss of these micronutrients and become malnourished. An additional 1.4 billion women and children are likely to have anemia or iron deficiency. The World Bank came out with a report that climate change could displace over 200 million people by mid-century. Rising sea levels, water scarcity, and declining crop productivity could force 216 million people to migrate within their own countries. There will be on the order of six hotspots emerging as soon as the end of this decade. Sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa, South Asia, East Asia and the Pacific, Latin America, and Eastern Europe and Central Asia. The Council, the US Council on Strategic Risks said that even at scenarios of low warming, each region of the world will face severe risks to national and global security in the next three decades. Higher levels of warming will pose catastrophic and likely irreversible global security risks over the course of the 21st century. Now, at the same time, humans are using up the natural world. Since 1970, Per person consumption has increased by almost 60% and GDP has grown by 400%. Much of this growth has come at the expense of the natural world, which is managed 
to keep up with rising demands for food, energy, timber, paper, minerals, and more. This paper in Science Magazine describes it as an unparalleled appropriation of nature that's causing the fabric of life on which humanity depends to fray and unravel. Since 1970, food crop production increased 300%, and half of all agricultural expansion has come at the expense of forests. In 2019, the rate of deforestation was one football field every six seconds. More than half of this was to raise cattle and the grain to feed them. 43% of all ice and desert-free land, two-thirds of all freshwater use, is for human food production. Over 80% of farmland is used for livestock, but it produces just 18% of calories and 37% of protein. Cattle and the grain they eat use one third of available land surface on this planet and 16% of all available fresh water. One third of worldwide grain production goes to feed cows. And producing beef generates 100 times more greenhouse gas than plant-based food. We're now in a situation where 86% of all land mammals are either livestock or humans. Of all birds, 70% are chickens and other types of poultry. Human overconsumption, population growth, and intensive farming has destroyed 68% of vertebrate wildlife since 1970. This has pushed us into the era of pandemics. There have been 335 new infectious diseases that have emerged since 1970. 75% of these are known as zoonotic diseases, which means that they jump from animals into the human community. Ebola, HIV, malaria, West Nile, anthrax, encephalitis, Zika, SARS, MERS, COVID-19, and others. These are called spillover events where microbes carried by animals cross to humans through contact between human communities, wildlife, and livestock. There tend to be four venues for these spillover events. One is habitat loss. Pathogenic microbes are displaced when we deforest or destroy savanna or other types of habitat loss. They intersect with human com communities and spread disease. 40% of the world's original forests have been eliminated. Humans have altered roughly six or 70% of Earth's land surface. The second venue is extreme weather events. Flood, wildfire, and heat displace humans and pathogens typically to the same location. And this results in a spillover event. We also have human immune systems weakened during extreme weather events. The third venue is vector expansion. As we destroy vertebrate wildlife, we tend to take out the charismatic megafauna first. We take out the big animals, the apex predators. This opens up the community of rodents and small vectors that carry disease. Now the tropics are expanding and all the other climate zones are expanding as well. And so mosquitoes, ticks, deer, mice, all types of rodents and other disease carriers are moving into human communities that had not seen them before. And lastly, we have concentrated animal feeding operations. These are a breeding ground for virulent pathogens. There's no evolutionary pressure on the pathogen to preserve the host. In nature, a pathogen cannot afford to continually kill its host. And so there is a selective pressure and natural evolution towards less pathogenic microbes. But when you cram thousands of chickens into a warehouse and every time one of them dies from avian flu, 
you pull out the carcass and put in a new one, there's no evolutionary pressure to become less pathogenic. In fact, there's natural selection to become more pathogenic. And so we have certain strains of bird flu, of avian flu that have over 60% fatality rates. We're doing this to ourselves through the way that we engage in factory farming of animals. And we have to keep these animals alive by pumping them full of antibiotics. Nearly two thirds of the drugs that are important for human medicine in the US are sold for food animal use for this purpose. And of course, this leads to uh, the very severe problem of bacterial resistance where antibacterials, antibiotics that we take as humans are growing increasingly ineffective to certain types of infection. Disease, environmental damage, climate change, and human inequality form an amplifying feedback. Disadvantaged groups suffer first and worst, resulting in greater inequality. The ratio between the income of the richest 10% and the poorest 10% on this planet is 25% wider than it, world, than it would be without climate change. So this is the history of carbon dioxide emissions since 1850. And this is what we need to do by mid-century. If we aim for two degrees, we get an additional 15 years. And as I mentioned, CO2 emissions have to be reduced by half in only 80 years. And yet we saw 2021 lead to an increase in CO2 emissions. And the International Energy Agency, British Petroleum, and other monitoring agencies and private companies that track emissions and fossil fuel use are all projecting continued emissions, not only this decade, uh, but all the way until mid-century. We haven't even talked about the reality of having to pull CO2 out of the air. If we don't pull CO2 out of the air and recover a safe climate, we're looking at the ice on the planet continuing to melt for over a thousand years. We're looking at continued human displacement. We're looking at fundamental threats to our human socioeconomic network. There will be some communities that we refer to as lifeboat communities who will continue to maintain complex, thriving socioeconomic networks, but they will be in the minority. Instead, we will have many, many communities across the world experiencing reduced socioeconomic conditions. This decade is a pivotal decade in the entire history of humanity. What we decide to do in the next eight years will lay out the blueprint for all future generations of humans. How do we stop warming? Our electrical grid needs to go to zero emissions. Renewable energy must be deployed. It's been estimated with three times the emphasis that it has been deployed in the last couple of years. And we are setting records for converting from fossil fuel emissions to renewable energy. Our existing fossil fuel infrastructure has to be decommissioned before its lifetime. This is especially hard because those who had invested uh, will not see the profit that they had planned. In fact, much of this decommissioning is going to uh, result in a loss. Transportation must become emissions free and buildings must become zero emission buildings. By 2030, one third to one half of all buildings on the planet need to be retrofitted for efficiency and for renewable energy. 
Agriculture is the largest individual sector of emissions. In fact, if we simply farmed differently, we could solve this problem. Because the way we farm opens soil to the air and the carbon in the soil meets two oxygens in the air and produces CO2. And our farm fields are sources of CO2. But if we didn't engage in deep plowing, and if we used cover crops, then we could be injecting carbon back into the soil through a network of rooted plants. We could also be replacing key nutrients in the soil that tend to be um, used up by our food crops. So cover crops at the same time uh, that we plant our food crops. We need to reduce animal meat consumption, and we're making great progress on this. We can now grow beef in the laboratory and chicken in the laboratory and fish in the laboratory. I see these as key investment opportunities. We're waiting for the US Food and Drug Administration uh, to approve some of these food products within the next two years. <clears throat> All humans need to move to a more plant-based diet, and it will also extend our health. Zero emissions industry, a lot of research still needs to go into how to produce zero carbon or low carbon steel. We now have made cement that actually pulls CO2 out of the air as it cures over uh, years and decades. And perhaps most importantly, our social tipping points, right? Those of you who are my age have seen social tipping points, right? We wear seat belts. We didn't used to. We don't drink and drive anymore. Most locations in the Western world, you don't smoke in restaurants anymore. Smokers are confined to going outside of a building. These were unheard of 10, 20 years ago. But social tipping points and large-scale uh, public education programs led to these very healthy, these very healthy uh, changes. Society has got to recognize the immoral nature of fossil fuel. And our consumer lifestyle needs to transition. Every part of society has to be involved. And this isn't just change. It's total transformation. There is great news. Solar, wind, and battery costs have plummeted. These are now affordable forms of energy. Fundamentally, we're moving from a pay-as-you-go energy economy to an upfront cost, then with extremely cheap costs after that. This upfront cost is the barrier to most people. And that's where government programs and subsidies can come in and solve that problem. Green investment is doing very well. Last year, the energy transition and climate technology, including renewable energy, storage, electric vehicles and heating, hydrogen, nuclear power, sustainable materials and carbon capture, all attracted more than 900 billion in investment. However, this needs to be over 2 trillion per year. So we're, we're not quite there yet. The energy transition sector pulled in $755 billion in investment last year. This was a 25% increase over 2020 and double what was invested in 2015 and more than a 20 fold increase from 2004. Renewable energy saw $266 billion invested last year, and it constituted almost 50% of all green investment. <clears throat> Electrified transport is on a rapid uh, increase. It's growing at 10 times the rate of investment in renewable energy. And in one more year, electrified transport will be a bigger driver of energy transition investment than renewable power. 
energy storage or battery growth last year saw a 30 percent increase in investment and this investment is is projected to double in a little over two years so i'm going to end and i'll end with this line it's not enough to cut emissions we need economic development that does not destroy, destroy nature and that url you see there is from an opinion piece i published in the hill uh, by that very title it's not enough to cut emissions all right so i'll stop sharing at this point and i think i've left time for q a and happy to take any questions you have maybe greg you want to uh, monitor the q a see see what we have yes we're using the slido platform for the questions so i've got some of those here um i did just post the link again in the chat and you can go there you can also vote for others questions if it's a question you would really love to see answered uh vote for that question and we'll try to get to those um one of the first questions and it's got a vote here is how do carbon offsets factor into the progress on stopping warming at 1.5 degrees c so we have a term here in Hawaii for uh, for a lie. It's called a shabai. To me, carbon offsets are a shabai. We can't escape the reality by paying someone else to not cut down their forest. We need to actually cut our emissions. And so if you're counting on carbon offsets, you're not really buying into the situation that's going on here. You need to actually cut emissions and at the same time, still pay those people not to cut down their forest. And in fact, invest in lands that can be preserved forever. So I do not have uh, much advocacy for carbon offsets. There's a wrinkle there though, which is direct air capture. So there's a company called Climeworks and in Iceland, <clears throat> uh, they've built a, um, a facility that pulls 4,000 tons of CO2 out of the atmosphere every year. And I visited there after the COP in uh, Glasgow in November. They are dedicated, <clears throat> dedicated to pulling CO, CO2 out of, the year for, out of the air for the purpose of uh, fighting climate change. Almost every other direct air capture um, technology and company is actually pulling CO2 out of the air in order to inject it into oil fields to stimulate more oil production. So be careful who you look at You've got to look behind the cover. There's really only one company I know of that's pulling CO2 out of the air to help combat climate change. This one facility pulls out 4,000 tons of CO2 a year. We only need 10 million more of them to equal the 40 billion tons of CO2 that we release every year. So, we, you know, pulling CO2 out of the air mechanically, while it's critical and important, can't do the job alone. Again, managing agriculture soil properly can be our most effective way to move forward. And the way to do that is through government, government subsidies, because it's very difficult to make a living as a farmer. And there are lots of government subsidies to farming communities, especially in the US. We need to tie to those subsidies certain types of soil conservation practices. Thanks. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Chip. Um, next question here is what two scenarios of the higher SSP models, uh, what are they attempting to model? So 8.5 and, and is it seven or is it six? What are those two highest? Yeah, so 8.5 <laughs> used to be called business as usual. And when the IPCC came out with their report uh, in 2014, that was the model that um, <clears throat> was used to characterize continued CO2 emissions 
without regard to the impact. But we've done better than that. And it should really not be called business as usual because today business of you as usual is 6.0. So 8.5 watts per square meter, seven watts per square meter. Uh, those are important to continue to model because we have parts of the natural world that are starting to fail. You saw the Amazon rainforest. I didn't mention permafrost. There's the boreal forest. We have other parts of the natural world which may be switching from storehouses of carbon to sources of carbon. Those 8.5 and 7.0 models will allow us to get a handle on the impacts uh, if nature starts to join us, which it appears to be doing increasingly as a source of greenhouse gas. But it's, it's not a relevant socioeconomic Path, pathway or modeling scenario. 6.0 is the most relevant. Another question here is um, to clarify the reason plants are becoming carbon sources versus sinks is because when they've reached a certain warming uh, level or period, they begin to absorb less CO2. Is that correct? Well, <clears throat> there's a there's a thermal maximum to photosynthesis, right? Photosynthesis and respiration is plant metabolism. And, you know, humans get heat disease and we don't do well as we get heat disease. Well, plants essentially are getting heat disease. In fact, models have shown that for one quarter, three months over the past decade, Every plant biome on the planet temporarily crossed that thermal maximum already and then has returned. So it's, yes, it's that plants are absorbing less CO2, but it's also that plants are releasing uh, more CO2. But yeah, it's a thermal maximum to photosynthesis is one way to think about it. So I'm going to combine a couple of questions here. Uh, one question is, what are the top things that individuals can do to make a difference? And the second part, combining a question is, um, what are the actions a young professional could take in their career or job to contrib contribute to this, solving the problem? Great question. So, you know, if you want to take a personal action, just so you feel like you are contributing to the solution, eating a more plant-based diet is what to do. That's been shown in studies as having the single greatest impact as an individual. And once you begin to participate, you get motivated to do more. You feel like you're part of the solution rather than wallowing in grief, right? I hope that I have given a fair amount of climate anxiety to you folks today. I did that on purpose. You need to feel anxious in order to feel the motivation to act. And if you're feeling anxious, you might be experiencing what has officially been called environmental grief, the loss of the environment, the loss of the planet. It's actually an official psychosis now that was published in Nature Climate Change, the premier journal Nature Climate Change two years ago. And in that paper, they identify climate scientists as the first people to experience this environmental grief. And I'm here to tell you, yes, it's a real thing. I was very, very depressed. It took me a few years to get out of it because the deeper I dug into climate change, the more I realized we are on a pathway to hell. So I became a vegan and I started talking. That's the skill set that I have. That's what I can do. If you have money, I would contact Climeworks. And I think that's a huge growth opportunity. Right now, it's a technology that has been proven. Climeworks is a private company. They aren't releasing some of the details of how much it costs to produce their plant in Iceland. 
they aren't releasing uh, some of the details on the chemistry of once they pulled the CO2 into their filters, how do they release it from there? What they do is they inject the CO2, they dissolve it in water and they eject it down into the crust. The certain types of rock will actually take that CO2 and turn it into a mineral, locking it away forever. Now, Iceland is made of this rock, it's volcanic rock. Hawaii is made of the same kind of rock. So if you wanna to move to Hawaii and invest in direct air capture sequestration, here's your opportunity to kill two birds with one stone. And lastly, you can pull CO2 out of the air. And if you can make green hydrogen, you break the CO2 molecule into carbon monoxide with hydrogen, you have a hydrocarbon. You can make fuel. And I've been pushing very hard here in Hawaii in order for our tourism economy to continue in the future. And yes, people will always want to come to Hawaii, even as certain parts of the world are collapsing. We need to make our own jet aviation fuel, and we can do it by pulling the stock, the carbon stock, directly out of the atmosphere and create a synthetic fuel. Now, we're not reducing the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, but we're not burning fossil fuels and we're not adding to it. So this synthetic fuel is a real investment opportunity. And if you pull just a little bit more out of the air, then you can inject that into the crust. And by the time aviation is becoming hydrogen powered and battery powered, which will be a few decades from now, the entire mechanism can turn into a sequestration factory, a sequestration plant, rather than a refinery. I'm basically talking about a new, a new type of refinery. Chip, do you have time for another question? I know we're sure, running yeah, I don't, I don't have to run. Okay. Um, a popular question here is, what do you think about solar geoengineering? Should we even consider investing time and research in those efforts? Well, unfortunately, um, you know, I'm a born optimist, but I'm pretty skeptical about the future. Um, I'm actually on a group that is looking at using the ocean uh, to store carbon dioxide. We can do that because the ocean is depleted in iron. And if you fertilize a patch of the ocean with iron, you'll get a plankton bloom. And as those plankton bloom, die, and then fall to the seafloor, they carry carbon with them that comes out of the water and out of the atmosphere. It's not quite that simple though. There've been lots of field experiments to look into iron fertilization, and no one has yet proven that the plankton actually make it through the photozone, photic zone. We actually think it's probably recycled into uh, the ecosystem that lives in the upper 300 feet of the water column. So we still have to figure out how to get net export of carbon through the photo zone down into the abyss. Now the National Academy of Sciences in the US just came out with a report on six ways that the ocean can be used to sequester carbon. So uh, that's, one, that's one way uh, that we're involved because I'm Dean of a oceanographic institution. We have ships and this is the sort of stuff that we can do that we're set up to do. So I would prefer going that way rather than experimenting with injecting ash into the stratosphere and attempting to block sunlight. Uh, we've modeled that. And our models show that the monsoon belt gets displaced. If you displace the monsoon belt, you're going to cause world war, right? The monsoons are a band of rain that feed the world. And if suddenly you take the agrarian societies of Southeast Asia and India and, and Africa and remove their rain because you've injected ash up into the stratosphere, you haven't done a very good thing. So I'd be very careful about certain types of geoengineering, whereas other types where you sort of go into the realm of nature-based solutions, much more carefully from an experimental point of view, uh, I'm in favor of. So I think maybe we'll try one more question here. Um, and sure. I've got a popular one. Is that okay? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, 
Well, I'll just throw out a point that I see here. Um, can you get out in front of the media? Can you do a TED talk? Can you, can, we'd love to see you get this message out to more people. And I'm seeing a lot of messages about that. So I just wanna throw that out as an idea. The question that many are asking uh, is what is your concern? What, is, what are your thoughts on nuclear? Is nuclear energy necessary to help us transition from fossil fuels? Uh, I don't think it's necessary, but I, I don't think we should take anything off the table. Um, I think there are, there are new forms of smaller scale uh, with redundant nuclear systems with redundant safety levels. Um, I haven't done a deep dive and it may be that certain communities may choose to go with nuclear, some of this new uh, smaller scale nuclear. Nuclear seems to work in submarines. It's just when you scale it up that you run into a number of problems, one of which is permitting and cost and time, right? We are in a crisis, we are in an emergency, and we don't have the 10 years it takes to get the permitting and the construction for a new nuclear power plant. It's just not nimble enough, but um, I think it still can have its place. I'm also seeing some today, I saw some interesting news on nuclear fusion, right? The, the experiments that are taking place at a half a dozen locations around the world, MIT in here in the US are making some uh, pretty good progress. So it may be that uh, nuclear fusion comes online, but no one expects that to be an instantaneous solution. Um, even if we are able to produce energy through fusion, in other words, get more energy than the energy we put into it, um, it will be decades before that translates into utility scale electricity. Well, well Chip, I think we've taken a lot of your time. We have a number more of other questions. Uh, maybe we'll even email some to you um, if, if that would work, um, but really well, want to it, it won't. It, it, it won't. won't. Okay. You got me right now, and I, I'm not running away. My wife said that she'd like to work another 45 minutes before I come pick her up. So, you know, I'm not leaving. If you guys want to leave, the hour's over. Please feel free to leave. But I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions if somebody wants to wants to ask them. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely good to go. I just didn't want to take advantage of your time. No, I um, appreciate it, but I'm good. So um, another question here is, what are some ways we can use less water or, or produce more clean water uh, to combat yeah, the food. water crisis? There again, food, um, you know, food production. Um, and in fact, pressuring, uh, con consumer pressure really is, is what's needed to get the market to respond. So uh, doing the research and finding out the uh, the types of food that are least water intensive, um, doing the research uh, into water, re water uh, conservation steps. The governor of California recently declared a, a water crisis because the four major reservoirs in the Western states of the US have now less than 30% of their capacity. Um, the what something like 98% of Western US states have been in a deepening drought for a decade now. Frankly, I think uh, West Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and Southern California are doomed. Um, a lot of the uh, food that Hawaii eats is shipped in from Southern California farmers uh, and Arizona uh, and Nevada farmers that all rely on the disappearing water resources. So I'm concerned for Hawaii because we only have a standing crop of 10 days to 14 days of food here in the state. And if there's an interruption to that, such as there was in mid-March when COVID-19 hit and suddenly all global trade shut down, um, uh, we, you know, we are not making enough food for ourselves here in Hawaii. And the same is gonna be true of many other uh, communities, not just isolated communities. So um, water is a huge issue and it's the very first issue if you think about it. 
Um, there's a lot we need to do uh, to engage in better conservation practices. A number of people are asking if you'd be willing to share this presentation. Oh, sure. You guys can have it. Do whatever you want. Yep, absolutely. Okay, great. Thanks. And this is being recorded, everyone. So uh, we will have a recording up. Uh, yeah, I see hopelessness. Time. I see the word hopelessness here in the chat. Um, you got to get past that. That's not going to help you or anybody. The solution to grief is work. But you know, there are these stages to grief, denial, negotiation, finally acceptance. You got to get through that and get to work. Uh, this is, this is there, there is no point at which we have lost this. And I'll tell you, frankly, we've lost 1.5 already. And two, that's a stretch. That's a real stretch to stop the warming at two. Um, but hey, I've got grandkids. I'm not going to give up. None of us can afford to give up. It's unethical. It's immoral. So get over your grief. Get to work. You'll feel better. I did. <laughs> so to go with that, uh, a question here is, what's the most effective way to stir collective effort or push for policy change? What do you think on that? Yeah, well, you know, as we now begin to emerge from COVID, I think we need to go back to nonviolent civil disobedience. Um, there used to be some great protests going on. I remember in Hawaii, there was a protest in 2017 and I showed up and there were 14 of us there. But then just before COVID, we had a protest of 1500 people in downtown Honolulu. And Hawaii is one of the most progressive states in moving forward on climate change. We're, we're doing things that many other states are not achieving, and yet it's not enough. So getting out there and protesting in the streets is very important, and there's a lot of that going on around the world. Um, for those of you who, who have agency, you know, perhaps you have resources, personal resources, perhaps you're comfortable contacting politicians, even those of you who, who do not, politicians show up to groups of people to talk to them constantly. Stand there and ask them the hard questions. What's your stand on biodiversity loss? Do you understand the relationship between pandemics and climate change? If we really start hitting our leaders with questions that we know are real questions, but they'll, they're not used to seeing them, they're gonna go home and they're gonna do their homework. So we need to hold our leaders accountable. I, I saw something uh, the other day, who's the uh, prime minister of, of England. Um, he had been talking about climate change, but it turned out it wasn't until like last year that he actually saw a PowerPoint talk from a group of scientists that finally convinced him that this was a real thing. And he had sort of been faking it the whole time because it was politically expedient to look like you were worried about climate change. Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson. Yeah, here's another question for you. Can our electrical grid handle all of the green investments that are being made and that are needed, uh, the switch to elect electrification? And uh, is there any good news here or what will it take? Yeah, so that's a major problem. And Hawaii has been out front um, on that one. You know, uh, so during the day, the solar panels on our roofs collect a lot of energy and send it back through the lines uh, to the utility. And we started seeing transformers popping and, and uh, electrical lines melting. That's a real problem. Uh, but battery storage is going to help. And uh, the Internet of Things can help, right? Software has been written and is being written so that in a neighborhood, your refrigerator is talking to your car, which is talking to the battery wall in your garage. Uh, all these places where electrons are needed and also electrons can be stored, there's an enormous amount of efficiency still to be gotten by having all of our electron uh, driven um, capacities 
talking to one, one another. So it's not just a two way back and forth between the utilities and the, the panel on your roof. So yes, there's a lot of hope there. And that's also uh, climate tech where, where there are a lot of investment opportunities as well. Again, we have a lot of software people in here. I think Internet of Things, what he's talking about here could be a great place for you to look into working. Uh, we, we have a research institute here in my school called the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. And they're writing a lot of software for our local utility, um, helping, helping manage this problem. Uh, another question, what's your view on EMG, ESG investment trends and divestment? It's great. It seems to be coming gangbusters. It really started taking off late last year. And, uh, you know, it, it's critical. Um, I'm telling our students that, you know, we're graduating students for whom discussions of climate change are comfortable. They're going into a workplace where most of the other workers are still trying to understand climate change. It's not easy for them to talk about it. And so companies everywhere want new employees who have a high comfort level with what sustainability really means, what resilience really means, what climate change really means, uh, not just as technical employees to help them go uh, reduce their carbon footprint, but just in everything that they do to look at it through the climate lens and through the human equity lens, I would put as well. Modern day college students, uh, hopefully are, I know they are here, getting a really good education in this stuff. And I, I hope that those of you who hire uh, new employees and hire from college, add into your interview questions, you know, an assessment of how, how well these people are informed of these global crises. It's going to be important to get a, you know, a working community who are comfortable with these problems. And it will just generally radiate out through everything that you do in your company. And you'll start to see the whole company pivot. I'm going to throw in a question of my own, kind of a fun question to break things up a little bit. Have you seen the movie Don't Look Up? And as a climate scientist, what did you think of it, if you have? Yeah, I saw it. I, I've seen it twice. It's pretty awesome. You guys, you guys are aware of that the last quote that Leonardo DiCaprio has as the walls are starting to cave in. It's such a great quote. He goes, you know, if you think about it, we really had it all. And he's right. Like, just look around you. We're so lucky. It's amazing what we've done. But you know, now we have to figure out how to do it, how to maintain our lifestyle, and also how to bring the, the developing world up to the same lifestyle uh, in a way that is not extractive, but instead is circular and regenerative. Yeah, thanks. Um, let me see, got, got a few more questions here. Yeah. Um, one is how much can active carbon sequestration efforts help in combination with various nations' promises? Not quite sure what we're getting at, but. Uh... Yeah, so it can help, but I'll tell you fundamentally what's going on internationally is that the developing world wants advanced transportation systems, power systems, hospitalization, education. They want what the Western world, what the developed world has achieved. Now the developed world achieved these at the expense of nature and at the expense of human equity. The developing world wants it too, and they deserve it. They should have it. But the tools at hand are fossil fuel tools. And, you know, if I were king of the planet, I would take the military and send them to India as a construction force. You know, it's World War II type of mobilization that needs to happen. Within six months at the U in the U.S., Every car manufacturer turned into a Jeep and tank manufacturer. We can do this, but we need to pivot and it needs to be the developed world helping the developing world, India and China, Africa, Latin America. These, all these nations deserve to have longer lifespans, 
greater equity, greater health, greater education. And by the way, as we educate more women, we will see a decline in the birth rate. The human population will go down once we get women, give women control of their own fertility decisions and also educate them. They go hand in hand. So the developing world is the real key to this. And I would like to see all the money in the US simply go towards the developing world. But Unfortunately, in the US, politics are not turning in that direction. In fact, they're turning in the opposite direction. I hope I answered the question in there someplace. <laughs> I think so. Um, sort of along the, those lines, a uh, question is provided the mismatch between existing positive trends and the needs for reducing carbon emissions, what do you see as a effective strategies that can be implemented to uh, turn that around? So state the beginning of the question again. There's a mismatch between um, positive trends, good things happening to address climate change and uh, the, the serious need to reduce emissions. So we're not doing enough quickly enough. Yeah. Uh, are there strategies you see that would be effective to turn that around? ESG. I mean, we need trillions and trillions of dollars of investment from the investment community into this problem. It's not enough for everybody to become a vegan. That's not gonna do it. So um, you guys know McKinsey? They just came out with a report. You can download it, the net zero transition. Uh, this is a consulting company that is very reliable. They, they produce amazing reports. They talk about how uh, investment, you know, What's the pathway for private investment uh, to resolving this problem? So this is this is something you can grab right offline. Um, government programs are important. Government policies are critical, but we can't do it alone. I really think the investment sector, the private sector, really needs needs to get on board here. And you know, it would have been great 20 years ago what we're seeing today, but at least we're seeing it appears to be that we're seeing a pivot just in the last 12 months. There's a question here that's pretty specific. Um, how do you think the earth or nature will try to reverse these issues? For example, what impact might they have on Old Faithful Yellow in Yellowstone, the eruptions? Oh, Old Faithful is not, it's not a, that's, that's not, part of the discussion here, we already see some things happening in nature. Uh, we see the slowing of a fundamental current in the ocean in the North, North Atlantic called the uh, overturning uh, or conveyor belt uh, current. It's reduced 15 to 18%. It's, it's taking less heat down to the deep ocean, leaving more heat up here on the surface. Uh, as that current continues to slow, we're going to see changes in the African monsoon belt. It's going to shift. The Greenland ice sheet and parts of West Antarctica are an irreversible treat, uh, retreat at this point. In fact, we see a set of ice streams in West Antarctica called the Thwaites Glacier and the Pine Island Glacier. They've been projected, the ice shelves, the floating ice shelves at the front of these glaciers, which hold them the main ice back like the bottle in a like the cork in a bottle that's laid on its side these floating ice shelves are now projected to fracture within 5 years so um, permafrost is starting to thaw all around the planet um, the question of how is nature going to react to this is taking place already and it's reacting in ways that amplify the problem not uh, reduce the problem. Nature, in other words, is attempting to get an equilibrium with a warmer planet. Just to add to that, there's a this past summer, a uh, Yellowstone climate assessment came out and they talked about one of the big impacts in Yellowstone is decreasing snowpack, decreasing river water runoff, and features like Old Faithful will actually stop erupting because there won't be enough water. Good to know. So, Glad I know. Yep. So, yep. Old Faithful is a uh, canary in the coal mine for water resources. Gets back to a fundamental question. 
thanks for thanks for educating me on that. Sure. Um, yeah, it's a pretty interesting report by Kathy Whitlock and others from Montana State University. That's my region, so I know a little. I know them and know a bit about it. Um, well, hey, I think thanks everyone for the questions. We have a few more, um, but I I think for the sake of our video and time, I think we should wrap this up. Um, really appreciate Chip your your time, your knowledge, your sharing. And uh, to all the fellows on here, I really appreciate all of you. This is hard to hear. It's important to hear. Um, and I hope that we all do take Chip's advice, which is feel feel the, the stress, the fear, the anxiety, and use it to act. We need to act. We don't have much time. We need to do it now. So thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks for thanks for being here, and thanks for engaging in uh, in Terra Do. You're you're already attempting to do something about this. So, and I usually say Take at care. this point, the name the name of the organization is Terra Do, not Terra Edu. It's not just learn; it's act. So go do. Thanks so much. Awesome. All right. Take care. Stay safe. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Fletcher. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Thank you so much.